a heavy heart for our friends and brothers and sisters in Christ who are waiting to get uh, an airplane ride out of Israel, Lord. I just pray you strengthen them, Father, that you protect them. I pray you have your hand over the nation of Israel too, Lord, the leadership and, and uh, the uh, soldiers that are fighting the battle, Lord. Strengthen them and give them courage. Father, we want to commit this time to you. We ask, we invite you to be here. Pray, pray you fill this room with your Holy Spirit, Lord. That, Father, you minister to each one of us in uh, the area we need to be ministered to. We thank you that you'll love us. We thank you that our hope and our future is in you, Lord. We just commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
everything that's going on in Israel, right? Everyone's probably has a lot of fear and just a lot going on, but we have a God that's greater, amen? amen. God is in control, amen?
the slain and the risen King. We lift our voice from heaven, singing worthy, Lord of all. Lord of all. Well, good morning, church. Um, I think all of us are pretty much aware of the things that are going on now in the world, um, particularly with Israel, um, and how thousands of missiles were fired from a terrorist group named Hamas, um, and hundreds of Israelis were killed as a result of that. And So today, it's especially um, personal for us because we have, last count I heard was about 48 of us who are part of Impact Bible Fellowship who are over there right now. And so... We want to pray for them, even as Bob did already, but we're going we're gonna to pray for them now, and we're going to pray for them at the end of service as well when we break up into small groups. But not only for them, but also for the nation of Israel as a whole. And uh, it reminds us when things like this happen that, that the Lord's return could happen at any time, that we need to be ready, that, that the things that, are, that we read about in Scripture could unfold at any time. And so we need to make sure our own hearts are ready. And it's interesting because when Marty was sharing the prayer request that they had over there, they're trying to get out. Um, hopefully, from, from what I heard, I'm hearing different things, but it sounds like they may have found a flight tomorrow to get out and get home. Um, so we're obviously going to be praying for, yeah, amen, <laughs> amen. Uh, but they're trying to get out of there as quickly as possible. In fact, uh, speaking with somebody else that was there, I found out that uh, we found out the airline, the Israeli airline, El Al, is actually offering to fly people to their home country so that they can drop them off and pick up Israeli reservists and bring them back to Israel to help in the fight. And so just praying for safety, <laughs> yeah, amen, uh, praying for safety for them. And the scripture that uh, Pastor Marty shared, if you're on the, uh, the prayer texting chain, was out of Psalm 122, and it says this, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, may peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Let's pray for peace. Father, we do thank you, Lord, that you are sovereign. Lord, that you have plans, that you knew beforehand that all of this was going to happen. Uh, Lord, we thank you that we can trust that you're in control. So, Father, we want to pray first and foremost, Lord, um, for, for peace for Jerusalem, peace upon Israel, that you would bring a quick end to this conflict, Lord, and that peace would again reign there. We pray, Father, that through this that you would do a great work in the lives of those who are believers in Israel and the surrounding areas. Lord, that they would be revived in their heart to seek you. We pray, Lord, that people would come to Christ as a result of this conflict, realizing, Lord, that time may be short. So we ask that you would pour out your spirit upon that place. Father, we pray especially for those who are part of this church who are over there right now. We ask you, Lord, to have your hand upon them, that you would bring them home safely to us. And Father, we also pray that, Lord, if they are anxious, if they are nervous, Lord, that you would give them peace, knowing, Lord, that they are in your hands. So, Lord, just bring a spirit of peace upon them and bring them home to us quickly, we ask, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. I will make room for you to do whatever you want to. Tradition, break down the walls. All my religion, your way is better. Your way is better. Shake up the ground. All my tradition, break down the walls. All my religion, your way is better. Your way is better. Oh, shake up the ground. Tradition, break down the walls All my religion Your way is better Your way is better Shake up the ground All my tradition Break down the walls All my religion Your way is better Your way is better better, isn't it? Well, please stay standing. We're going to have someone come and read God's word. Right here at the fancy mic. I get the fancy mic. Good morning, church. Good morning. I'm Cheryl, in case you don't know. Um, hey, hi. <laughs> We're going to read out of Hebrews 3, verses 12 through 19. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Remember what it says. Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. And, and who was it who rebelled against God even though they heard his voice? Wasn't it the people Moses led out of Egypt and who made God angry for 40 years? 
Wasn't it the people who sinned, whose corpse laid in the wilderness? And to whom was God speaking when he took an oath that they would never enter his rest? Wasn't the people who disobeyed? So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter his rest. Three things I saw on this. One was we need to remind ourselves not to harden our hearts because we do that when God calls us, and I love that, making room for, for the Lord to do whatever he wants because sometimes when the Lord asks us to do something, it's hard. In fact, it's always hard. So we need to remind ourselves to not harden our hearts, and I just think about the Israelites they refused to go in, and now they're trying to be kicked out. So we need to encourage our brothers and sisters in Israel that they need to hang on to fulfill those promises that God has called them to do. And they've called them, God's called them to stay in there. So we need to encourage, that's the second thing, we need to encourage each other. And third thing, we need to endure no matter what those trials are. And I love how Dave Samora talked about trials last week, and here we are in the midst of a trial. God is faithful, he always is, and he will call us to surrender. And I, I just remember, Christians, we need to encourage one another as, as God calls us to take steps of faith. I love the fact that two of our ladies, um, Michelle and Elise, are feeling called to go out to do the Great Commission, and that is hard. We need to encourage them and know that, they're be, that we're behind them. We need to encourage our brothers and sisters because it is going to be hard. We have Jamie who's going to come do our announcements. You guys can go ahead and grab a seat.
grace we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, only for you.
guess I should introduce myself. Some of you may not know who I am. Um, I'm Cheryl's husband, the one who read the scripture. So, <laughs> It's a blessing to be here this morning. Um, I just want to pray, first of all, that, that the Lord would speak to our hearts as we open up his word together. So if you'd pray with me. Father, we thank you that you love us so much, Lord, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross to cover our sins. We thank you, Lord, that you love us so much, Lord, that you want to have a relationship with us and that you have chosen to speak to us, Lord, through your word. And so this morning, Lord, as we open your word, we ask that the Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts. Lord, that you would bring application into our life of the things that we're reading. Lord, that uh, it would be personal. And that, Lord, that we would be challenged to live a, a deeper relationship with you, live a life more committed to you, and even as we have already sung, Lord, a life more surrendered to you. So, Father, we pray that you would do your work. Lord, we, we open our ears, our heart, our spirit, Lord, to what you would say this morning to us. Lord, I pray that, um, that the words that come out of my mouth would be yours and not mine. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Because we're not quite ready to read the scriptures yet. Um, so, it's, it's, it, some of you may not know me. Um, we're involved in a, uh, a homeless ministry, and Pastor Marty asked if I wouldn't share just a little bit about what we do, and some of what's in the message uh, is involved with that as well, but uh, 18 years ago, the Lord called uh, a guy by the name of Jim Ward um, to start a ministry with the homeless. Jim is actually sitting back there. Jim, raise your hand. There he is right there. <laughs> And uh, he just started out with a few pizzas and a Bible and went out to a, a picnic table at Fairmount Park and began to um, invite and minister to people who are out there. Over the years, that has grown. God has done some tremendous things. I, I didn't get involved until about 12 years ago myself. But through that initial act of obedience, which Jim will tell you wasn't easy, he didn't want to do it at first, but he relented and, and decided that he would. Um, God has really blessed the ministry in a lot of ways. In fact, um, we started uh, gathering food. For, we, we feed everybody on Thursday night. And so uh, during on Thursdays, there's a lot of work that goes into preparing large pots of food and bring them out to the park for people to eat. And that provides us with an opportunity then to be able to share the word with the people who come and who eat. And so we ended up over the years developing a relationship with the food bank of Riverside and San Bernardino County. And uh, we started receiving donations, not only from them, but also from stores throughout, throughout the Riverside area. And so it grew. And so all of a sudden, we're going to all these different stores throughout the week and bringing food in, and are able now to put that food together into food boxes that feeds about 250 families every week. And so that's a great blessing. And then at the same time, um, we, we started a Bible study on Tuesday. Uh, so every Tuesday morning, 11 o'clock, uh, we meet together at Fairmount Park. And so what it is, is Thursday is sort of like our Sunday service, if you will. And Tuesday is kind of like our Wednesday night service, it, it kind of that way. So people who are really hungry, those who are out there living in the river bottom or living in the downtown area who are hungry for the word, that are spiritually hungry, can come and get fed at that Bible study. And then on Thursday they come and, and they're being fed physically as well. And so God has blessed that ministry. It's been such a great opportunity. We've met so many people over the years um, gone through a lot of struggles. Um, it's, it's, in a lot of ways, it's no different than, than our church. People go through things. People die. People uh, go to the hospital. People go to prison. I don't know how many people here are going to prison, but um, that happens. And so there's such an opportunity to be there when those things come up in life. And we've seen fruit come as a result of those things. And so um, it's, it's a hard ministry because it, it's tough to get through to people sometimes. Um, they've heard the gospel many, many, many times. And so the best way that we can share the gospel with them is through loving on them and finding ways to, to pour into their life. And so that kind of just describes what we do ministry-wise. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that a, a little bit today, um, about some of the barriers that the homeless have with getting not only spiritually having barriers, but also being able to get into things like housing. It seems like such a simple thing. We, we read about it so much in the paper all the time. Oh, the, you know, people, there, there's housing out there. They can get housing. There are a lot of barriers. These are very broken, broken people. And so there are barriers there. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But in the context um, of, 
I think the title's up there. No, he didn't put it up there. So the title of the message this morning is, So You Want to Go Back to Egypt. And we're going to be in Numbers chapter 13. Anybody recognize that title from a guy named Keith Green? A few people. Yeah, yeah. Keith Green was, uh, his music was pretty, uh, pretty important in my life, early on in my Christian life. And he, he did do a song, So You Want to Go Back to Egypt. And we're going to read about that today. Um, numbers, I'm, I'm just, I, I tend to uh, give a lot of background before we go into the scripture, so bear with me as I do that. We're actually going to start in the book of Genesis, so settle in because it's going to take us a while. No, I'm just kidding. It, it, <laughs> I'll summarize it, but some of you may be aware that those first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are called the Pentateuch. And they really form the foundation for what God is going to do throughout history, when you think about it. It's an amazing thing. And I mean, all that's going on right now in Israel, and realizing that what we're going to be reading about today is about the beginnings of that, of what God was going to do. But as you know, we've been going through the book of Genesis on Sundays, and uh, so you know that it's, it's, it's really a story of new beginnings. It's, it talks about the creation of the world, the fall of man. And, and the thing that's particularly important for what we're doing today is it's the beginning of the nation of Israel is introduced in that first book. And it's not really a nation in the book of Genesis. It's more of a family. God comes to Abraham, and he calls him. And he says this in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. The Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so right from that very beginning, the call of Abraham is essentially the beginning of what would be called the Jewish race, if you will. And I know a lot of you know that. Genesis really only goes right up to the point um, with just a couple of generations from Abraham. And at the end of that, we read that they go, that, that the descendants of Abraham go into Egypt because of a famine that's in the land. And if you're familiar with it, you know that they end up spending 400 years there. So that's Genesis. That 400-year gap between Genesis and Exodus leads us to the time of Moses. So the second book is Exodus, and that is really where this family, these descendants of Abraham, become the nation of Israel. In fact, it grows to what's estimated to be 2 million people at the time that Moses leads them out of Egypt. As you know, they were in slavery there for most of the time that they were in that land. They were in slavery. They were crying out to the Lord, deliver us from slavery, deliver us from this bondage, wanting to get out. And the Lord hears their cry, and he raises up a man by the name of Moses to lead them out. And so they leave the promised land, and they go out, and, and they come as far as a place called Mount Sinai. I'm sorry, they, don't, they leave Egypt, and they're moving towards the promised land, and they get as far as a place called Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, that is where God speaks to Moses and gives him the Ten Commandments, and he also gives him instructions on the construction of the tabernacle, which in essence is, is a place where they're going, the presence of the Lord is going to come and where they can meet with him. That is all happening in Exodus. We also read that during that time that the Lord led them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So that takes us through. So from this, at this point in Exodus, all we're seeing is they're moving from the promised land, I'm sorry, I'm just going to keep doing that, Egypt to Mount Sinai. Then this third book, which is Leviticus, all of that takes place at Mount, at Mount Sinai. They're camped at the base of Mount Sinai. Moses is receiving instructions throughout that entire book. And so that there is where God gives instructions on the order and the rules of worship in the tabernacle. That brings us to the book we're going to look at today, which is called Numbers. So keep in mind, again, in the book of Leviticus, they're still in Sinai. But in the book of Numbers we read about how they finally move out from Mount Sinai and go towards the Promised Land. The, the book is actually called Numbers because there's a census taken in two different places in the book of Numbers that actually lists how many Israelites there were at this point. And so that's where, that's where the book gets its name. But what's key here is that the children of Israel now are leaving Mount Sinai, and where are they going? They're going to the Promised Land. And as you know, um, they didn't get there very quickly. In fact, they moved from Mount Sinai to a place called Kadesh Barnea. Keep that in mind, Kadesh Barnea, which is on the very southern border 
of, of the promised land. So they're right there. They're at that point, Kadesh Barnea, and they're ready to go in. As many of you know, due to their unbelief, they don't end up going in. And that's what we're going to read about today. They spend 40 years in the wilderness until that generation dies. But what's important about that in terms of, of the message today is they made a decision at Kadesh Barnea. And that's the decision that we want to look at. Um, just by way of a little bit more background, um, the children of Israel, from the very moment they left Egypt, they had a real problem with grumbling, complaining, and moaning. Do you know anybody like that? Who All you ever hear, it seems like, from them is grumbling and complaining. Well, that's what they did. From the moment they left Egypt, they started grumbling and complaining. We have no food. In Exodus chapter 16, they're like, we have nothing to eat. So what does God do? He provides manna for them, which, by the way, is the name of the ministry, that the homeless ministry is man ministries. You know that when they, had, when they went at, to Mount Sinai and Moses was up receiving the Ten Commandments, they began grumbling and complaining, and they ended up actually fashioning an idol, a golden calf, out of jewelry and worshiping it. And so, again, a kind of a rebellion against God. And then again in Numbers 11, it says that the people were complaining and grumbling again and so God brings fire on the camp. He literally, you read about it in, in Numbers chapter 11, he brings fire and singes the edges of the camp because of their grumbling. Moses prays for them, the Lord stops the fire. Immediately after that, same thing, I literally, immediately after that, in Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 through 6, we read this. The rabble who were among them had greedy desires, and also the sons of Israel wept again, and they said, who will give us meat to eat. We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic, but now our appetite is gone. There is nothing at all to look at except this manna. So think about that. They had grumbled and complained, so God gives them this manna to eat, and now they're grumbling and complaining again because they're tired of the manna and they want some meat. Well, if you're familiar with the story, you know that God gives them meat. In fact, he pours quail down upon them, so much quail that it's three feet high is how much quail they have. At the same time, God actually strikes them with a plague. And there's a lesson there. They're, 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 they're complaining so much, and God is providing for them and has promised to continue to provide for them, and yet they keep rebelling and keep grumbling against him. They keep longing to go back to Egypt. If you go through this, you'll see it over and over again. They want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back to Egypt, forgetting that they had been in bondage, in slavery there, and only thinking of their current situation where they didn't feel as comfortable as they would like to. Egypt, in Scripture, often is a picture of our flesh. And so if you think about that, it's this longing for the old life. It's this longing for the pleasures of sin, which pulls us many times and tempts us many times to go back into it. So here, the children of Israel are at Kadesh Barnea, and they make a decision here in chapter 13 that they're going to go into the promised land. The Lord has said, this is yours. I will give it to you. And they decide that they want to send spies in. And if you read Numbers 13, chapter 1, it says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send the spies in. But it wasn't God's idea. The idea to send the spies in was the people's idea. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 1 that the people came to Moses and said, we want to send spies into the land. And Moses, he thought that was a good idea. So he said, okay. So the Lord tells them how to do it here in Numbers chapter 13. And what he does is he basically says, I'm gonna, we're going to send 12 spies in, one from each of, the tribes, uh, each of the tribes, and Moses ends up putting Joshua in charge of that. So there's 12 spies, one from each of the tribes, basically, and they're getting ready to go in and spy out the land. So keep that in mind. The two key characters here are Joshua and Caleb. So if now you would stand with me, <laughs> I just want to keep you awake, that's all. Numbers chapter 13, we're going to read verses 17 through 20. When Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said to them, go up there into the Negev, then go up into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live in it are strong or weak whether they are few or many. How is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? And how are the cities in which they live? Are they like open camps or with fortifications? How is the land? Is it fat or lean? 
Are there trees in it or not? Make an effort then to get some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. All right, you can be seated. (laughs) So Moses is giving instructions about the spies going in. What is it that they're supposed to look for? And he tells them to evaluate three different things. He says, I want you to go in there and evaluate the people. I want you to evaluate the cities themselves. Are people in fortified cities or are they in camps? And thirdly, he says, I want you to go in and see if the land is fat or lean. In other words, is, can we survive if we go in there? Now, just that, just that one point right there is showing unbelief. God had already told them that this land was filled. It was milk and honey. It, was, it would more than take care of them. But they were concerned about whether they were going to have food there and about whether they would have lumber. Are there trees there? Can we build our homes? And so what I want to do is take those three points, the idea where they're going in and saying, we're going to evaluate the people, we're going to evaluate the location, and we're going to evaluate the provision. And I want to apply that to our own lives and also to the lives of the struggles of the homeless in terms of getting off of the street. And so let's start with with the people. So in verse 18, we read it says, see what the land is like, whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25 says, The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. Hear that again. The fear of man brings a snare. And how often does that happen? That that people, the people in our lives, become a hindrance from us moving forward in faith. In other words, if they're going to go in there and evaluate those people, they're going to make their decisions on what they see in terms of the people, not in terms of what God has already promised them. So it's not going to be based on faith. It's going to be based on sight. And so what they do is, hey, are the people strong or weak? Are the many or few? And I can tell you that this idea of people and relationships is a huge hindrance to homeless people getting off the street. That's what I've seen many, many times. And when you think about it, they're living in the river bottom or they're living, um, sleeping, uh, you know, on a, a doorstep of a business or something like that. And when you're living in the river bottom, especially if you're a woman, a lot of them are being protected by a man. Very, very important down there because of the things that go on down there. And so the idea of having that protection is very important. And it doesn't even matter if the guy's abusive. The key is that he's over me. And so leaving that, leaving that person is a very difficult thing to do. Others, because of their loneliness, because they don't have somebody, they end up gathering to themselves dogs and cats. So when you don't have somebody human, you start picking up dogs and cats. And what happens as a result of that? It makes it so much harder for them to get in anywhere because not a lot of places will take dogs or cats. And a lot of times they'll have three, four, five. I've seen a woman out there with 25 dogs that she was taking care of. And so that becomes a barrier. You talk about, sometimes we talk about, well, let's get them into the shelter. And if you had any experience with going to the shelter, you realize that there's a lot of drama there because a lot of the people that are in the shelter are the same people that were in the river bottom before. And so the idea of going in there and not being able to go back to a tent, but having to sleep in cots where I have 45 other people in the room who are in the exact same condition that I am and are just as broken as I am is a very difficult thing to do. They would rather stay in the river bottom than go into the shelter. And so it's the people there, the drama there, that keeps them from moving forward. But I I look at it and I go, those same hindrances of people can exist in our own life, right? Sometimes relationships that we have hinder us from stepping out in faith. Even in the beginning, when we first became a Christian, we had to make decisions. I know I did about who I can hang out with and who I can't. Who do I need to separate myself from? Because I don't want to fall back into the old life. I don't want to go back to Egypt. I want to keep moving forward. And so a lot of times it's true for us who have a roof over our head that fear of loneliness or fear of severed relationships or even fear of loving in general because we've gone through so much abuse in our own lives hinders us from moving forward in faith. Now you and I know that the answer to that is to be reborn in Jesus Christ. We know that that changes everything. So even though there are people, they're not as important as that relationship that we have with Christ. It's the idea of surrendering. And so we know that's the answer, and that's what we're trying to convey when we're out there at the park, is you need to come to that point of surrender and obedience to him. So people is the first barrier. The second barrier that we read about here is looking at the cities. They go in to spy out the land, 
And here in, in verse 19, it says, how is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? And how are the cities in which they live? Are they like open camps or are they with fortifications? Location can be a hindrance to moving forward in faith. The idea that if I take this step, I'm going to land here, and what's that going to look like? I mean, how, how is that going to look? You don't know. Sometimes the Lord says, you just need to do it. You need to go. And when you get there, I'll take care of whatever does need to be taken care of. Now, that is absolutely true for the homeless in terms of getting off the street. They're oftentimes the places that are available for them to live because of the limitations of money, whether it's through the county or anybody else, is they end up moving far away. They go, I'm not far, far away, but far enough away. Hemet, Indio, Desert Hot Springs. And so they leave, they get out of the river bottom, and they go live there, but they're completely severed from all of their support system. They have nothing there to sustain them. They don't know how to live. They've been, they've been fed by churches who are out there providing for their needs all the time, and now all of a sudden they're separated from that. So they're fearful. How will I eat? How will I get clothes? Most of the clothes that I get, they come from churches. They come from clothes closets, essentially. How am I going to be able to afford shoes? So those are the things that go through their mind. It's been a long time, if ever, since they created a budget. The idea of how much, how can I live? How do, how do I do that? They, they don't know that. It's been a long time since they've held a job, if they've ever held one at all. And so the idea of making sure that I'm on time, um, that's something that's scary for them. The other part is because of the ravages of what they've gone through in the river bottom, particularly like drug use, they might not have any teeth. And so who's going to hire them? You know, who, who's willing to hire them? And so those become barriers, that location. Like, what's it going to look like when I get to the other side? But that's true for us, even those of us with a roof over our head. I like what Pastor David said last week in talking about how so many of us, including us, have thought about moving out of California. The idea that, man, I just can't take the culture here anymore. It's, it's just too much. You know, I want to go someplace that's, you know, more Bible-friendly or whatever. And in fact, our son, Jacob, um, who lives in Los Angeles, he's, he's been doing that exact same thing with his fiance. He's visited Austin, Texas, and Houston, Texas, and Phoenix, Arizona. So looking for a place, where can I go where I can live that's somewhere outside of California? And I like what Pastor David said, that if the Lord wants you to move, he'll make that clear. But in the meantime, he has you here. So what is it that he's calling you to do here in this moment? If we keep waiting for that, that moment when we're somewhere else, we never do the things that God wants us to do. He's asking us to move out now. If he's putting something on your heart to do, if he's asking you to take a step of faith, we need to take that. And again, we know what the answer is. The answer is to trust Jesus. God knew where he was taking the Israelites. He knew what that land was like. He had really been preparing. I mean, think about it. It's been 400 years since he told Abraham to go to this land. So he knew exactly what it was. And so it was a matter of whether or not they were willing to trust God in his promise. The third thing is found in, in verse 20, and it has to do with provision. Verse 20, the spies are supposed to go in, and, and, and the questions are, how is the land? Is it fat or lean? Are there trees in it or not? Make an effort then to get some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. And so again, like I said, they want to, let's go check it out, see if there's going to be enough food to eat, see if there's going to be trees so we can build our homes, have some lumber kind of a thing. And I would tell you that this idea of provision, like making sure you're taken care of in terms of your physical needs, is definitely a hindrance many times to moving forward in faith. For the homeless, I've already kind of mentioned it, but if they move any distance away um, from where they are now, they don't know how they're going to eat. They just don't know any of that. And so they look at it and they go, you know, I, I don't know how I can survive. And yet God is promising the Israelites, going, you don't need to worry about that because I've already taken care of that for you. I've told you that it's a land of milk and honey. I will take care of whatever your needs are when you get there. But that provision, it, it can be a hindrance. Instead of, for us as well, instead of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and believing that all these things will be added unto us, we become workaholics instead. We're so afraid that we won't have what we need. Or, instead of setting time aside, let's say in the morning,
to be with the Lord. Instead, we go, I got to get to work. I've got to get out. I got to get out early. I got to run out there. And we neglect that time with the Lord. Sometimes we use our families as an excuse. We use our children as an excuse. And as we continue reading, you're going to see that's exactly what the Israelites do. But I know that I've done that in my own life. And I'm talking about this idea of coming to Kadesh Barnea, which is right on the edge of the promised land, and whether or not they're going to move forward or not. Cheryl and I have had Kadesh Barnea moments in our own life, where God, we feel like God is calling us, and yet we shrunk back because of this last thing, this provision part of it. God had called me to be a pastor. Um, I pastored at Reed Park uh, from 1999 to 2001. And during that time, our kids were between the ages of 7 and 14. I was working at San Bernardino County, um, and they were very gracious to me. They, they let me um, work as many hours as I wanted or didn't want to, which even that's from God. That's just an amazing thing. A county job where you can work as many hours as you want is pretty amazing. And yet what happened, the, the, the congregation we were ministering to was, was not rich. Most of the people in there were, were pretty poor. And so there wasn't a lot of money to be able to give, say, as a salary for me. And so we struggled through that, and, you know, we, we, we were making a certain amount, and then we would cut back, and I would work more at the county. Then we, I would cut back some more because we didn't have enough money in the church to take care of it, so I'd work more for the county, more for the county. And that just kept going on until the point where I finally came was like, I am not doing justice to either the county or the church because I'm not able to put the time in. And because I had children between the ages of 7, 14, seven and 14, it was like, I got I to gotta resign as pastor and go back to the county. Now, I can't say for sure that that was, you know, God, not God's will. I don't know, but I still feel that inside. I feel like I didn't trust God to provide what was needed. He could come up with ways that I could never imagine. And in fact, that's what he did when finally I quit after 20 years at the county. I finally quit that job, and God has provided immensely for our needs in the meantime. I got another different job that I do from home that I have complete, uh, I, I can work whatever hours I want. And so God has provided for our needs. But again, I think we can use that idea of provision as an excuse not to move forward in our faith. And that's what the Israelites end up doing. Now in verses 21 through 24, the spies do go into the land and uh, they spy it out. And they bring, they actually pick some grapes, some clusters of grapes that's so heavy when they come back that they're carrying them on a pole. Two guys are carrying it and the grapes are hanging from the pole. And that brings us now to Numbers chapter 13, verse 25, if you'd read that with me. When they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Thus they told them and said, We went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, underline that word, nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, the cities are fortified and very large, and moreover we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek, Amalek is living in the land of the Negev, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites are living in the hill country, and the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. So we read here that the spies went in, they spent 40 days, and from the description of where they went, they, they went to all the way up to the north. So they didn't just you know, go in a little bit to the land and check it out. They literally went way up to the top, came all the way back down and checked it out. And so they come back, they meet with Moses, Aaron, and the congregation at Kadesh Barnea, where they're camped, waiting to go in, the southern border of the land, and they give their report. So remember, the things that they were supposed to find out about was the people, the cities, and the provision of the land. And so they report on that. And the report is basically, the land certainly does flow with milk and honey. Look at these grapes. I mean, it, it, there's plenty for us to eat there. Nevertheless... The people of the land are many and strong, and they're like giants. The descendants of Anak are, um, th you, you can read this throughout Scripture, but basically they were very, very large men. Uh, David and Goliath, Goliath was one of them. 
an example of that, somebody who was very, very big. And so they were fear, they were afraid of them. And then thirdly, they say, well, the cities are really strong and they're fortified and they're big. So here's the report. The land is everything that God said it would be, nevertheless. So right from the word nevertheless, you know that doubt has crept in. Like, I don't know if this is a very good idea. In other words, the land is just like God said it would be. He told us that he would give us the land, but we cannot do what he asks us to do. It's outright rebellion. And it, we'll see it. it. It's very clearly rebellion. This word, this nevertheless. And I think sometimes we do that in our own life. Even though, like Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And then we say, well, Lord, you've abandoned me. Or Jesus says, as I've already mentioned, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Nevertheless, Lord, you're not going to provide for my needs. We do the same thing. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Nevertheless, I'm not capable of doing it because of my own weakness or inability. We use nevertheless in our life as well. How many times do we doubt or dismiss God's promises because of the circumstance or because of the perceived weakness that we have in our own life? That's not acting in faith. That's acting with sight. It's exactly what the Israelites were doing. What, what do we believe more? Do we meet, believe God's word or what we see with our eyes? Do we believe God's word or the circumstance? Which one will we put our trust in? And that's what they're being asked to do. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Faith is essential. It's, I, I love the songs that we sang this morning because they talked about that idea of I will surrender, I will surrender, I will surrender. And God wants us to have that faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And when we see God get angry at the children of Israel, it's because of their lack of faith. That's what angers him. It's not other things. That's the key issue for him is their lack of faith in him. So what happens? Let's keep going. Verse 30. Caleb quiets the pe quieted the people before Moses and said, We should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. Now you got to love Caleb. So the, the main report was, Great land, nevertheless, people are too big, city's too fortified. And Caleb goes, Hey, let's go. Don't you love being around people like that? Or just like, Hey, I mean, it's come, sometimes it's scary, too, because, you know, you, you might not want to do it. But I just love somebody who has so much faith that when God says go or do or whatever, they're willing to do it. And it's just such an encouragement, I think. And, and, and certainly the, the Bible talks about this idea that some people have the gift of faith. I mean, it's just an overwhelming faith. And they're great to be around. And I think Caleb is just exactly that type of person. We'll learn later on that Joshua also agreed with Caleb that they should, you know, we should go in and take the land because God has promised it to us. Caleb made a clear stand to believe God and said they should take the land as God had instructed them. And again, it's just Caleb and Joshua. Let's keep going. Verse 31. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able. So this is the other ten spies. The men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report, which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone in spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Well, now this makes it pretty clear, right? These other ten spies are saying, we should not go in. The people are too big. The cities are too strong. In fact, they exaggerate. They, they really do. They, they went in, they, they checked it out, but they talked about the, the inhabitants of the land devour people. Well, I, I, don't, I don't see that in the scripture. I don't know what they were talking about there, but it was like an exaggeration of what would happen. And then they talk about, well, uh, the, the, uh, we're like grasshoppers to them. And again, obviously that's an exaggeration. What do you think about it? They're saying the people are too strong not if the Lord's with you. They're not. The land devours its inhabitants. Not if the Lord is with you. They don't. And we're like grasshoppers to them. Well, that's irrelevant if the Lord is with you. And he told them to go in. 
So then it becomes an issue of faith. And a lot of times in our own life, we exaggerate the circumstances. We look at a trial that we might be going through, and we make it far, far bigger than it needs to be. Is anybody else in here guilty of that? We just tend to exaggerate things like, man, there's just no, this is terrible. And so, again, not operating on faith, but going, this is just too big for me. It's too much. And so here we have the children of Israel at Kadesh Barnea, on the border of the promised land. They've heard from Josh or from Caleb that they should go in. They've heard from the ten spies, the other ten spies, that they should not go in. And so they are at a place of decision at Kadesh Barnea. This is the moment of truth. Will they go forward as the Lord commanded, or would they turn back? Would they listen to the ten spies with the bad report, or would they listen to Joshua and Caleb? Would they enjoy the new life in the promised land that God had promised them, or would they return to bondage in Egypt? And again, I look at this and go, oftentimes we come to that Kadesh Barnea moment in our own life where we have to make a choice. And sometimes I'm amazed at the homeless people who are willing to do that. They come to a point with all the worries I talked about before, and they make a decision finally like, I'm done with this life. I am done with it. I, I don't want it anymore. I want to move forward. And even though they have a lot of fears, they make the decision to move forward. And that's what God is calling us to do as well. But what does Israel do? Well, look at chapter 14, verse 1. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. People wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. They make their decision. The people cried, and they heard the report that came out, and they, they listened to the ten spies, and they cried, and they wept all night. They wept because God was not going to make it easy for them, that they had to take that step of faith before they would experience the goodness of the land that he had promised to them. They were weeping with an attitude of resentment towards God. How could you let me get into this situation? How could you let us get in the situation we're in? They were weeping because of their unbelief and their fear even though God was telling them to go forward. From their perspective, it was better to die in the wilderness or better to die in Egypt than to follow the command of God to move into this land. That's how they were, that was their perspective. In other words, anything would be better than trusting God in this circumstance. That's how they were looking at it. And before I get too hard on them, I realize I've done the same thing in my own life. I do the same thing often. I start weeping. I start crying to God. I want to do anything but what God may be calling me to do. And we allow that fear of the unknown to keep us from taking that step of faith. Though God had promised to the children of Israel many times to give them the land, they were convinced that they were going to perish once they got there. It's a complete lack of faith. They'd seen God bring the ten plagues on Egypt as they, they, they were freed from their bondage there. They had seen God open up the Red Sea and walk through it. They had seen God lead them a pillar of cloud and a fire by night. Day after day after day, a pillar of cloud and a fire by night. If you wanted obvious evidence that the Lord is with us and leading us, you're seeing this cloud and this pillar of fire day in and day out. Yet somehow they had forgotten all of this. They justify their unbelief on the basis, and it's interesting, because I talked about this a little before, but in verse 3 they say, our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Will become plunder. So it's the idea that their concern is for their children. It, it's for their wives. Now, let me first of all say that, that that's clearly just an, an excuse, because there's so many other things going on here. But you look at it from a, a logical point of view, and you can kind of understand their concern. At this time, based on the census we read in Numbers chapter 1, there were 600,000 Israelite men who were capable of fighting. If there were 600,000 men, the estimates are that there was probably 400,000 women. 
that there were probably 100,000 senior citizens, men who were not old enough to be able to fight, or I'm sorry, who were too old to be able to fight. And there was probably 800,000 children. So think about that. You're moving through the wilderness, and, and, and that's a lot of children. That's a lot of senior citizens. And, and the wives are doing the best they can. And so in a way, we can kind of understand that the prospect of going into the promised land and having to fight against these enemies, it's going to impact my children. It's going to impact my wife. It's going to impact my family. But the thing that they forgot as they were looking at that is that God had promised the victory. That it was all, the battle was already won in essence. All they had to go do is go in and actually take the land. And yet they were trying to use their families as an excuse. And that's where faith comes in. When you look at it, like, okay, God wants me to do this thing, but there may be, uh, there may be some, uh, consequence is not the right word, but there may be some impact on my family or on my life as God calls me to move forward in my faith. Maybe he's calling me to do something specific. And so we look at that and it becomes daunting. There's fear that can set in for us. And so faith, this is where the faith comes in. We have to ask ourselves the question, when we get to that Kadesh Barnea moment of we're going to believe God and go in, we have to ask ourselves some questions. Is God good? Is God good? Does God always keep his promises? Yes, he does. Does God share the concern for our families that we have? Does he understand the concern that we have for our families? Of course he does. There's no question about that. And here's a tougher one. Do we believe that the fulfillment of his will is greater than our present comfort? Let me say that again. Do we believe that the fulfillment of his will is greater than our present comfort? And then you look at the scripture and you realize the things that Jesus said when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he knew he was about to go to the cross. And what did he say? Not my will, but thy will be. And in fact, even in the Lord's Prayer, when you think about it, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Is that more important to us than our present comfort? Well, it wasn't for the children of Israel. They decided that in verse 4 we read that they, let's appoint a leader and we'll return to Egypt. So they make, they make the decision, we want to go back, we don't want to go forward. Now we're going to end with reading these verses, um, the, just the last part, because what is the response then to them going, we're going to appoint ourselves a new guy. We don't want Moses anymore. We don't want Aaron anymore. We want a guy who's going to take us back to Egypt, back to the old life, back to bondage, even though they weren't seeing it that way. Verse 5, it says, Moses and Aaron fell on their faces in the presence of all the assembly of the congregation of the sons of Israel. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, of those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But the congregation said to stone them with stones. And then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. So in response to this desire of the children of Israel wanting to elect a new leader, appoint a new leader, and go back to Egypt, Moses and Aaron fall on their face. Joshua and Caleb rip their clothes and begin to remind them of God's promise. Don't turn back. Don't do it. God's promise that the land was good was true. You saw it with your own eyes. But the congregation is listening to those who are saying, don't go in. Don't have faith. Don't believe. It's better to go back to Egypt. God always honors his word. He always honors his promises. And so what Joshua and Caleb do is they remind, they're trying to remind the children of Israel, God is good, God loves you, God has the best for you. And he's reminding them, and that's why it's so important for us to get into the word on a day-by-day -day basis, because we need to be reminded, because we start looking at things 
the circumstances of our life, and they can seem overwhelming. But when we go to the scripture, we read about God's promises, it strengthens our faith. And even though we may have read something many, many times throughout our life, we go back to it, and the Holy Spirit brings the application into today, into this moment. We do need to remind, be reminded of God's promises over and over. And notice that, that uh, Joshua and Caleb call this lack of faith rebellion. It's rebellion against God. And so they say, look, the people will be our prey. And I like, I like how it says, the Lord has removed their protection from them. And I always think like, well, you've got to make me stronger so I can do it. But sometimes he works on the other side and he removes the protection from something else. So he's working in ways that I can't even think about. It's like, hey, if the, if the Lord removes their protection, they're going to lose. It's going to be, it, it, it'll be a rout. And so he says, and finally says, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with his people. So their response, sadly, is they want to stone Joshua and Caleb. They want to kill them. Ultimately, uh, that's what they're desiring. And then at the last part of that, we read, the Lord shows up. So all this is going on, all, all these things are happening, and the, the glory of the Lord descends upon that tent of meeting, upon that tabernacle. And if you're familiar with the story, God is very upset at their lack of faith. And he wants to wipe them out. And he says, Moses, you know, I just want to wipe them out, and we're going to start fresh and new with you. Because, you know, you're a man of faith. You're, you're willing to go forward. And Moses intercedes for the people. and says, Lord, don't do that, because then people will talk about how you, you brought them all this way, and then you just wipe them out. And God says, all right. He listens to that prayer. But he says this, nobody that's in this camp who is 20 years old or over will go into the promised land. That generation will pass away completely before you get to go into the promised land. And so they wander in the wilderness for 40 years until that generation dies out. And the only two who get to go in are Joshua and Caleb because they stood strong. They, stood, they, they believed what the Lord said. So just kind of in summarizing, um, if we're not careful... We can look for ways to doubt God's word. In other words, kind of like, let's spy out ways to doubt God's word in our life. And sometimes uh, the enemy comes in and he, he can work through people. Um, fear of what others think. He can work through location. Fear of where you're going to end up if you take that step of faith. Uh, provision. He, fear that God will not take care of our needs. And when we we act on that instead of acting on faith in God's promises, we can end up wandering in the wilderness. It, it certainly has happened in times in my life where I was, felt like I was wandering in the wilderness, that I was far from God. And I don't want to do that. I, I want to live in faith. And the passage that Cheryl read, um, Hebrews chapter 3, I just want to ask you, are you maybe at a Kadesh Barnea moment right now in your life? Where God is saying, I want you to take that next step of faith. Whether it's something that, that he wants you to serve with, or go somewhere, or talk to somebody, or whatever it is. And I pray the Holy Spirit would bring that application to each one of our lives. Are we at that Kadesh Barnea moment where we have to make a decision either based on faith or on fear and shrink back from what God has for us in the future? What Cheryl read in Hebrews chapter 3 says, Take care, brethren that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. That passage goes on and what Cheryl read makes it very clear. The children did not enter into the promised land because of unbelief. That was the only reason. And I want everything that God wants for me. And, and sometimes that's going to be hard. It, it, it's going to require giving up things. But I want to move forward with him. I want to surrender more of my life on a daily basis to him. And I would just close with this. Always fall back on what you know. If you're at that Kadesh Barnea place... Fall back on what you know for sure. What do I know for sure? I know God loves me. There's no question about it. I know that God keeps his promises always. 
I know that God wants me and you to have an abundant life. He, he says that. Jesus says that. Those are things I can hold on to and go, okay, I know that. Even though I don't understand it, I know you're good. I know you keep your promises. And I know you want abundant life for me, whatever that might look like. So the question this morning is, you know, do you want to go back to Egypt? Or do you want to move forward into what God has for you in your life? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that um, as we read about the children of Israel, how often we see your patience. <laughs> uh, it's just amazing. And Father, a lot of times, Lord, we only give uh, half-hearted faith. And so, Lord, for that, we ask for your forgiveness. I thank you that you bear with our weakness and are patient towards us filled with loving kindness upon us. And I want to just pray for each one of us, Lord, that uh, you would strengthen our faith. That, Lord, we would not be ruled and dictated in our life by the circumstances, but that rather we would be ruled uh, by the promises that are in your word. Help us to hold fast to those, Lord, we pray. And if there's anybody right now who may be really at a Kadesh Barnea moment, I do pray, Lord, that you would give them the faith to move forward into what you have for them. Lord, help us not to shrink back. Help us not to want to go back to Egypt, to go back to the old life, but to, Lord, grow in our relationship with you. Lord, we love you. Uh, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So before we have the last song, uh, we're going to split up into groups of four or five people and just spend a little bit of time just praying um, for Israel, for Jerusalem, for our church family who is over there, for protection for them. Um, and again, that God would just work in and through this to bring more people to Jesus Christ. So if you guys could just split up and just for a few minutes, um, we're just going to pray together.
bless the rest of this day and our week and again be with our team lord in jesus name